we understand that when a decision is made to visit a church, one of the more challenging things is to know where to go and what to do when you arrive. What we want to do is to offer you another perspective. At First Baptist Church, we're committed to offering premier facilities along with programming designed to bring about spiritual formation in your life. Whether you're a student, young adult, senior adult, median adult, children, no children, whatever your life stage might be, you'll find there's a place for you here at First Baptist Church. The good news we know today is that Jesus, though once dead, is now alive forevermore. Let's stand and sing together.
praise our risen Lord. The moon and stars, they wet. The morning sun was dead. The Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, his blood poured out.
to hide to evening Whose words alone can catch a falling storm I know my Redeemer lives I know my Redeemer He lives Oh, creation testifies to the weary, the worn and the weak, and the same gentle hands that hold me when I'm broken. They conquered death to bring me victory. Ken and uh, choir, if uh, I'm not on here, there we go, there we got a little volume. Hey, good to be back with you this week. Uh, I miss being with you and uh, I tell you what, I really grieved last week not being with you. That was the first Sunday that uh, in 25 years as a pastor that I had uh, been out due to illness and uh, so I was really grieving. That was something new for me, being out sick. I was always one of those guys that thought, you know, how do you not just suck it up and go up there and preach and get it, then you can get back in bed. And uh, well, while you were worshiping, I was bowed at the porcelain throne of shame last week. So uh, 
That's how it happens. But it's uh, good to be back. And uh, I know you enjoyed hearing from John. You know, every church I've ever pastored, I've always told the staff, I said, you guys need to keep a sermon ready. You know, there may be some Sunday uh, where I wake up and I can't go. So you need to keep one loaded up in the gun. And, uh, and they do. And I knew John would have one ready. And uh, he's a gifted communicator. I know that you enjoyed uh, hearing from him. He always brings a, a great deal of passion uh, to the opportunity to preach. And, uh, and I know that uh, you enjoyed hearing from him. What I want to do this morning starting out is I want to cast some images on these screens that uh, capture some historic events in our, in our recent history. The Space Shuttle Challenger explosion in 1986, uh, 9-11 that collapsed the Twin Towers uh, in 2001, uh, 2003, Space Shuttle Columbia, these seven astronauts were killed upon uh, re-entry, and then the Deepwater Horizon, uh, the BP drilling platform uh, that uh, collapsed, I think that was uh, 2002. 10, the worst environmental disaster in, in U.S. history. There's a, there's a common thread that runs through each one of these tragic historic events. And the common thread is that there were warning signs. There was advanced warning of these things happening that were ignored. Uh, engineers, uh, Morton Thrykall in particular, the engineering firm uh, responsible for uh, the building of the solid rocket boosters on the space shuttle, they knew that the O-rings were not working in sealing those, uh, in sealing those seams uh, in those solid rocket uh, boosters, uh, even the, the day of the launch, uh, because NASA had such go fever, uh, they ignored the warnings of, of engineers, even though they told them that this eventually was going to happen. Uh, when it came to 9-11 in 2001, it was known that there were operatives moving in and out of this country, uh, that uh, there were foreign operatives that were even taking flying lessons in, uh, from flight simulators preparing for, for such an event. Uh, when you come to the Space Shuttle Columbia, uh, NASA engineers uh, and contract engineers knew that uh, foam insulation in previous shuttle flights had been striking the leading edge of the wings of the space shuttle. Uh, in fact, all three shuttles showed damage, showed fissures, showed stress cracks on the leading edge of the wings of each of the shuttles. Nothing uh, was ever done. The very morning that the Deepwater Horizon uh, drilling rig collapsed, engineers had warned that the shortcuts that were being taken were going to lead to this very thing. Warning signs that, that were ignored. We have a history of ignoring things, tragic things. In 1889, a group of engineers went to Pennsylvania to inspect a dam that was holding the water back from a valley below. That summer, when they first went out and inspected that dam, they said that the dam was in critical condition, that they needed to start taking proactive steps to abandon, to evacuate this valley below, that the dam could go at any time. That fall, they returned and said that the situation is even more dire. But the people, for whatever reason, because they had heard it so often, they chose to ignore the warnings. In the spring, the engineers returned once again and said that the dam breaking is imminent. And in 10 days, the, tamp, the dam broke. A rider, a young man on a horse, made advance warning into Johnstown, Pennsylvania, giving warning that the dam had broken, that a wall of water 60 feet high is on its way. But because the people had heard the cry of wolf so often, they ignored the warning and over 2,000 people died. I think it's our nature to want to see only what we want to see, to ignore warnings. I wonder how many of you have ever noticed that on the interstate. Have you ever seen the big sign that says, observe all warning signs under penalty of law? Have you ever noticed that sign? I mean, we, we have warning signs all down the highways, all down the interstate. And, and, yet, and yet, even though we have warning signs, we have a sign that warns us about the signs. Observe all warning signs under penalty of law. We have a history of ignoring warning signs. That's why we have the prophets in, in the Old Testament. We, we hear their warnings. They were saying to the people of God that you're a very unique people. 
That because God has called you, he expects you to be a very unique, a very distinctive people, to be separate from the culture in which you find yourself. You're not living as the people of God ought to live. Therefore, repent or the judgment of God is going to come against you. The people did not repent. The judgment of God came against them, usually at the hand of other nations. Over and over again, whether it's the minor prophets or the major prophets, you see that cycle. You're the people of God. Repent. Live as you ought to. If you don't live as you ought to, the judgment of God is going to come against you. The Apostle Paul in our passage of Scripture today, we continue in this series through 1 Corinthians as part of our theme on God's family, church family, and your family. Paul is writing to this church family that has been established, a very strategic location there in the city of of Corinth. And Paul is, is emphasizing to them their uniqueness. The reason they have to fight for their identity. And and Paul is offering them a a word of warning. And the word of warning that that Paul is giving to the church at Corinth, it has it has perfect application to our world today. Because you see, there's, there's warning signs all around us that, that just as there's a falling way, a falling away in this early church, we, we know that there is a falling away in the church today. You see, God has always been warning his people. God has always sent messengers as a word of, of warning. John, ba- John the Baptist appears on the scene and he, uh, he says, behold, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus comes. He says, the kingdom of God is among you. The overwhelming majority of the people don't follow. They they disregard him. And when he doesn't bring a message that they want to hear, there's a great falling away. In Matthew 24, near the end of his ministry, Jesus says, listen, in the last days, things are going to be bad. People are going to disregard their faith. People are going to have nothing to do with the kingdom of God. The biblical writers pick up on that. The apostle Paul will say to Timothy, in the last days, men will forsake sound doctrine. They're no longer going to be interested in the word of God. They will gather to themselves teachers that will tickle their ears, that will tell them what they want to hear. Things are going to be bad in the last days, the writers say. And what was true for Paul in his writing to the church at Corinth is true for the church today. Do you know statistically that 26% of Americans say they attend church regularly. I think that's high, that's a 2006 figure. 26% of the people that say they attend church regularly. What I find interesting is there's another statistic that that 16% of Americans lie about going to church regularly. I mean, I don't even get that. Apparently there's some virtue, it's some positive attribute if you lie, if you go to church. And so it's viewed in such a certain way, people say, well, I'll I'll just lie about it. Yeah, I go to church. 16% of the population lie about going to church. But what has changed, even in the the span of 25 years in my pastoral ministry, whenever I would use statistics like this, statisticians use this figure for regular church attendance. A regular, regular church attendance 25 years ago was defined as someone who attends three out of four Sundays a month. Three out of four Sundays a month. Today, statisticians use a figure that if you attend church one out of six Sundays, one out of actually four to six Sundays, one out of every four to six Sundays, you're considered a regular church attender. So 26% of the population today says that they are regular church attenders, that, that they attend church at least once every six weeks. Well, you can see the waning influence that that the church is actually having in America. And as I read these passages of Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, in verses 16 through, through 23, the end of this chapter, the words of warning that Paul is giving to the church then is the same warning that the church needs to hear now. Because the warning that he's giving, the the word of warning that he's giving is these are the areas where you're most likely to err. These areas that I'm warning, these warnings that I'm giving you where I'm I'm informing you is in in areas most likely where where you're most likely to be mistaken. Where you're most likely to misunderstand what it is to be the church, what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And the first warning that that he gives here in verse verse 16 is that that the temple is a people place. 
Now remember in our preceding verses, Paul has already introduced the, the metaphor of a building. To talk about the role of each one of us, how we have a role in the building up of the church. He's using that metaphor of a building. But now then, notice how he moves and how he transitions from talking about something that is generic, a generic building, to talking about something that is specific, a temple. And so he says in verse 16, do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? He uses a second person plural pronoun. Do you not know that you, the plurality of it, you, you're the temple of God. You're the one that has Christ dwelling in you. You're the church. Now, I love the way he transitions here because in the Greek language, there are two words that can be translated as temple in English. And, and sometimes in the New Testament, whenever you see the word temple, the word that is translated as temple, many times that, that word temple is just a referral to the, the temple proper. It's just referencing the temple proper. Imagine yourself being over the temple and, and it's the footprint of the temple, if you will. It's the courtyards, it's the outer courts, it's the inner courts. The entirety of the temple is represented in that, in that particular form of the word temple. Another Greek word that is also translated as temple in English is a word that refers to the Holy of Holies. Now, the Holy of Holies is that innermost court within the temple that is considered to be the most holy of ground, the most sacred of ground. It, it is in the mind of the Jew in that day. It is, it is literally the presence of God. It is the dwelling place of God, this Holy of Holies. Now, when Paul says here in verse 16, do you not know that you are a temple of God, that the spirit of God dwells in you? Guess which word for temple he utilizes? The holy of holies. No longer are we bound by this temple theology, this idea that the presence of God is localized, that the presence of God is defined by, by, by some building, by some structure. No, what Paul is emphasizing to the church at Corinth and what we need to recapture, the warning that he's offering us. The magnitude of this, of what Paul is saying is this, that the presence of God is not about brick and mortar, it's about hearts and lives. It's not about coming here to a, to a building, even though this is important. The writer of Hebrews will say, do not forsake the gathering of yourselves together, which has become the habit of some. There is something very significant about what we do as a corporate body, what we do as, as a church body coming together, the synergy of coming together and fellowshipping and worshiping our God together in symphonic voice. There is something very powerful, something very cathartic about that. But what is most significant for Paul, what he wants them to understand is that you're the temple of God. Don't be intimidated by the temples of Corinth. These mighty, impressive architectural feats that, that are used to represent false gods. And these shadows were falling on these simple, modest homes where they were meeting. Don't be intimidated by those kind of buildings and structures. Because you're the temple of God. The presence of God is not limited to some locale. It's not limited to some building. It's not brick and mortar. It's hearts and lives. You see the significance of that? I mean, it changes everything. When we leave from this place and we go out to the school, we go out into our workplaces, when we disperse out into the community, I mean, you can imagine us leaving this place, visualize it, the power of this vision, if you will, of us if, as we go out. It's like ants going out from a mound. The streets, the venues, the avenues, the thoroughfares, that we're just being dispersed out, that we're the temple of God. We're the presence of the living Christ. In our community. It's what Stephen, it's what Stephen was trying to emphasize. If you go back to the book of Acts, in the book of Acts chapter 7, Timothy is under accusation 
from the religious leaders because they're, they're trying to maintain their structures. They're trying to maintain their, their religious traditions. And so they've, they've trumped up charges against Stephen and, and they've said of him in, in, well, in chapter six, verse in verse 14, for we've heard him say that the Nazarene, Jesus, will destroy this place. You see how concerned they are about brick and mortar and the preservation of brick and mortar. We've heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. There's great satisfaction since the day of Moses, they've, or since really the building of the temple, they, they've had great satisfaction. And just going to a certain building at a certain time at a certain place and feeling like they have appeased God. Because I've done my religious duty, because I've, I've assembled in a building, I have, I have reason to be, to be pleased with myself. But listen to what, to what Stephen says, how Stephen responds to this. In chapter 7 and verse 48, however, Stephen says, the most high does not dwell in houses made by human hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne and earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of, and this is the Lord asking this question, the, the foolishness of it, what, what kind of house will you build for me? In other words, what kind of house, what kind of structure could you possibly put together to define me, to localize me, to limit me? What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? See, our understanding of the presence of God was never intended to be limited to brick and mortar, to some kind of physical structure. Paul says, let me, listen, let me give you a warning. The temple of God is a, is a people place. You can't localize God. Now, the implications of this are obvious. This is another warning that, that he gives. And Paul really embraces the voice of a prophet here because he sounds very much like one of the Old Testament prophets when he reminds us in verse 17 that not only is the temple a people place, but it's also a holy place. He says in verse, in verse 17, if any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy. And that's what you are. Now, remember, he's transitioned from this idea of the temple being, being a physical structure, that that represents the, the presence of God, to now you're the temple of God. You're the, ho you're the holy of holies. You're the one, not, not this building, not this structure. You're the one that has the burden of, of being the temple of God, of representing the presence of God. And you're a holy people. You're a holy temple. Now, that doesn't mean we walk around all self-satisfied and all sanctimonious like some believers like to do to our detriment. That really hurts the rest of us because most of us get it. We just walk around like sinners and we're just sinners saved by grace. And, and this idea of being a holy people, that doesn't mean we walk around with halos over our head or at this kind of arrogant self-righteousness that, that, well, I've arrived. Maybe someday you can get where I am. That's not it at all. This idea of being a holy people means that I understand that I've been set apart means that God has done something. God has acted in time and eternity through his son, Jesus Christ. And his desire is to separate. His desire is to cut some away so that you will be my presence. You will be my representation. You will be my witnesses in the world. That's what it means to be holy, to be a separated people. It's a people that recognize that they are unique, that they have a, a very distinctive identity. When I told you earlier that the word Paul uses is holy of holies to describe us, when he says we're the temple of God, you're the holy of holies. In the old covenant or under the old law, let me give you an idea of how, of how sacred the holy of holies was considered to be. The holy of holies was a place where only the high priest could enter on the day of atonement. The highest, the highest festive day in Jewish history. It was the high holy day of the year. When the high priest would go into the holy holies and would make a, a sacrifice and a, to atone for the sins of the people. 
And so holy was this event, so holy was the holy of holies, so sacred was it, was that, was that the underling priest would stay up with the high priest all night before the holy of holies. They made him pull an all-nighter, an all-nighter before the, holy, before, the, before the day of atonement. And the reason was, was that the high priest did not want to fall asleep and run the risk of having a sexually oriented dream and thus defiled himself from going into the Holy of Holies. Are y'all awake? I mean, that's pretty crazy stuff. Now, now say what you will about the old covenant and the old law and say, man, I'm glad I'm not under that anymore. There's something to be said about that sense of holiness and sacredness that, that has been lost that needs to be recovered. And, and you, you may still be under the old law. If you're one of these that, that thinks that you can show up to a physical building like this on Sunday or you, know, you show up at a, at, a, at a particular place at a particular time like, like Easter Sunday or something and then you can walk off thinking, man, I've just, whoo, thank goodness I've appeased God for another year. You're just as much under the law as, as, as the old Jewish customs. It means you don't get it. It's not about being, being at a particular localized place. It's about, it's about living out of a relationship. And when I really understand this relationship, when I understand what it is to be a product of God's grace, that is something that is transformational. It means I understand that there's a calling on my life to live my life, not according to the customs and the morals and the values of the world. We'll look at it further. I'm hesitant to even share it because I'm going to be dealing with it in the weeks to come. But in just, just jump ahead for a moment in verse six, chapter six, verse nine, Paul says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. This, this is what characterizes the former life. Some of you practice these kind of things. That, that, that's an unregenerate life. Paul's not condemning an unregenerate life. He's saying, that's what you used to be. But now then, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. If you really get New Testament salvation, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. You have been born again. You have been born anew. Now then, you have a whole different set of values and standards. You look at sin completely different. The best analogy I can think of is when I became a, a Christian in college. When you're born again, it changes your perspective on sin. And this might be, get it in terms we, we can understand. Because before I became a Christian, I mean, I, I sinned. I knew what I did was sin. I, I, I didn't need an education on, on sin. Uh, when, when, I, when I sinned, man, I loved it. Man, it was about the moment. It was about the fun of the moment, the pleasure of the moment. Before I became a follower of Christ, before I gave my life to him, before I was born again, and I sinned and I loved it. But now, I still sin, but I loathe it. I loathe it because I know it falls short of what Christ is doing in me, this work of sanctification. I know I've been justified. I know he's doing a work of sanctification that will continue in me. See, that's what salvation is. It's something that has a beginning back here, but it is something that is transforming you throughout the entirety of your life. And it changes your whole perspective on sin. When you once sinned and loved it, now you sin and loathe it. We're all sinners saved, saved by grace. That doesn't change. But what I'm seeing today and what I'm hearing today in the Western church is so many who think that grace is a license to do whatever they want to do. That somehow 
Grace is the joker in your deck. That, that, that grace is the trump card that you can play at any time. Well, I can do whatever I want to because I've, I've, I've got the ace of spades. I've, I've got the wild card right here. I've got the joker. I, this is my trump card. You know, Paul, this isn't anything new. The apostle Paul dealt, dealt with this. Listen to what he said in, in chapter 6 of Romans in verse 1 and 2. What, sh- what shall we say then? Are we, are we to continue in sin so that, so that grace may increase? And that was an attitude Paul was dealing with. Some people say, well, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna keep sinning. I'm gonna sin all the more so that, so that grace will have a greater work in me. Paul says, what shall we say then? Are we, are we to continue in sin so that grace may, may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Paul says, it, it's an enigma to me how you could even imagine this idea that, that grace is a trump card, that, that grace is somehow a license to do as we please. You see, when, when we're followers of Christ, when you give your life to Jesus Christ, when you say, this is who I'm going to be, it makes us not only keenly aware of our sin. It not only changes our perspective on sin. I, I, I think that's a negative perspective. And I, I don't think negativity in the, in the long run has, has the lasting impact as, as a positive turn on this. And the positive is, is that when, when we're growing in Christ Jesus, when I understand what it is to be a holy person, that I've been set apart, when I understand what grace is, that I'm just a product of God's grace. It has nothing to do with my religious performance, that I'm just a product of God's grace. I have a realization not just of my sin, but also my responsibility. Knowing how he has acted on my behalf, knowing what what he has done for me, having paid the ultimate price for me, not in a sense of gaining my salvation and working for it, but out of a sense of gratitude and thanksgiving, the responsibility and the obligation that we embrace. Robert Massey wrote a book several years ago, and there's an illustration in, in the book that I think captures well what, what I'm alluding to. The book is entitled The Last Courts of Europe. And it, it's, uh, it's a book about the different, uh, roy, different members of the royal family. But in, this one, in, this, in the book, there's a wonderful story about Princess Victoria, who would eventually become Queen Victoria. Princess Victoria had found a book of, of the genealogies of the kings and queens of Britain, of England. And as she was, as she was reading through this, through this listing of, of genealogies, she was stunned when she came to her name. And she turned to her governess and she said, I'm closer to the throne than I ever imagined. And then tears welled up in her eyes. And she said to her governess, I promise I'll be good. Maybe what we've lost is our sense of closeness to the throne of God. A closeness and awareness of what grace has done and what grace has accomplished that beckons us to say, you know what? I want to do good. I want to do right. I want to be the kind of person that God has designed me to be. You see, Paul's giving a a warning. He says, the temple is a holy place. You're a holy people. Live accordingly. But then he says something else. The temple is an attitudinal place. I don't even know if that's a real word. I liked it though. I made it up. Sound good to me. Attitudinal. The temple is an attitudinal place. Fits my purposes. And since I have the platform, that's what matters, I guess. (laughs) Attitudinal place. And, and of course, when, it, when Paul's talking about attitude, what he says, what he talks about first, what he's describing is an attitude of, it's an attitude of humility. Now, he, he says here in verse 18, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he may become 
wise. For the wisdom of, of this world is foolishness before God, for it is written, he is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise that, that they are foolish. You see, what, what can happen is we start to think more of ourselves than we ought. We're more sophisticated than Paul. We're, we know more than Paul does. And we're, more, we're more informed on life than, than, than the apostle Paul. I mean, the, the behavioral and social sciences have introduced so much to us in, in understanding the human dilemma and human circumstance. You know, Paul knew nothing about genetic predisposition. Paul, Paul understood nothing about those sort of things that we understand today. The problem with us ascribing to new authorities is that new authorities are always changing. What's considered a, a reliable source today is, is, is by the next generation of researchers, it's relegated to the dungeon of footnotes. And the, and the only constant for us as the church, as the people of God, what our touchstone must always be, our reference point must always be the word of God. And we get to a point where, where we can embrace the spirit of arrogance and, and think that we know more than, than we really know. Guinness, the Guinness Book of World Record says that, that the, the highest IQ in, in well, the highest IQ recorded that uh, they have is, is held by, by Marilyn Voss Savant. When someone asked her on an occasion how, how she kept herself in check, how do you keep it in perspective? How do you, how do you humble yourself when, whenever it's said of you that you have the highest known IQ in the world? And she said, whenever I start thinking more of myself than I ought, I always remember that I'm biodegradable. <laughs> Maybe what we need sometimes is be reminded that we're biodegradable. That, that we're immortal people, that we're going to die, that we're from the dust, we're going to return to the dust. We're, we're biodegradable. And what Paul is making an advocacy for here, because there's a spirit of exclusivism in this, in this church, in this church in Corinth, where people are dividing themselves up and, and identifying themselves with, with, certain, uh, with certain human personalities and, and really the kind of cap taking on a, a groupy mentality. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm, I'm of Peter, I'm of, I'm of Jesus. Listen to what, what Paul says as he vies for the unity of, of the church. In verse 21, so then let no one boast in men, for all things belong to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all things belong to you. And you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. In other words, we're, we're all in this together. We're building it. We're all a part of the temple. Of, we are the temple of God. And what he's emphasizing is that every one of us has a role. Every one of us has a part. Lee Iacocca in his autobiography, Iacocca, go figure, with his ego. He talked about a conversation he had with, with the late Vince Lombardi, Super Bowl champion coach, the Green Bay Packers. He said when asking him about the success of his organizations, he said Lombardi responded that, that you know, every football team tries to get at good athletes. He said, you know, the key to the key, one of the keys is always having good athletes. He said that, you know, all coaches understand X's and O's, but he said, what made us unique and the reason we were so successful is that we understood family. We understood what it meant to be a team. That every one of us had to embrace this responsibility, this obligation of being a member of this team. And that when, when, when Bart didn't do his job, somebody else's job was going to suffer. When this person decided to take the playoff and not, and not block, it, it, it wasn't just their decision in that moment that affected them. It affected their teammates around them. And that's what Paul is vying for here in the unity of the church, that every one of us being a part of the church, being the body of Christ, being the temple of God, you and I have a symbiotic impact upon one another. That means when I don't take seriously my commitment to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, as I'm out there in the real world, when I'm not mindful of who I am in Christ Jesus, you suffer. That when I'm not living up to my witness and my testimony, it impacts your witness and your testimony. 
I wonder how many of us have really embraced that kind of passion for the church and understand the nature of what it is to be the church, to be the presence of God. To understand the importance of you upholding your end of the deal, me upholding my end of the deal, vying for the church. Jesus said, I'll come to divide mother against father, daughter against mother, son against father, brother against sister, sister against brother. He's making a point that these biological relationships, they're they're not going to last. Pour yourself into something that is eternal and everlasting. Do you know, I used to tell my kids when they got old enough, I used to say, you know, if you're going to go to the dark side, go to the dark side. Man, I want you to be the best at whatever you do. So if you're going to go dark, if you're going to go to the dark side, man, jump in with both feet. I'd rather you do that. I'd rather you jump in and just go dark, just go to the bad side. I mean, you got to make a choice. You're going to walk in the light or you're going to live in the dark. You're going to run with dogs, you're going to get fleas. If you're going to go that way, go that way. Don't straddle the line. Kingdom of God and kingdom of man do not coexist with one another. If you're going to go dark, go dark with all your heart. Because if you try to do both, you hurt us more than you help us. Us, the church, the body of Christ. See, I'm I'm more concerned. Those biological relationships, that relationship, that's going to end when I'm dead. One of us. But what the church is doing, what the church represents, the body of Christ, it's something that's eternal and everlasting. It's going to keep going. And I'm more concerned about that witness and that testimony and the impact that that witness and testimony of the body of Christ is going to have. I'd rather just go dark than go out there running around with a bunch of outlaws and then come over here and sit in the pews on Sunday morning when everybody around you knows you're a phony. Because that's what you're going to do. Man, you hurt us more than you help us. You're going to go dark, go dark. I'd rather just go dark. You hurt us more than you help us. That's what Paul's talking about. Fighting for something that is, that is of eternal worth and value. It's a warning sign for the church. It's a people place. We're the temple. It's a holy place. We're called to be a, to be a holy people. It's an attitudinal place. That realizes we're, we're the team. We're team Christ. This is our locker room. We get motivated. We get inspired. Then we go out and we disperse so that others might come to the temple. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that our time of decision would be a time of reflection for each one of us. For each one of us to contemplate what it is to follow after you. Of what it means to be a a holy people. What impact it makes that the spirit of the living Christ dwells in us. That we are the presence of Christ. Father it's been such a refresher for me in my prayer of recommitment and rededication is to be mindful that we are a holy people. To be reminded that the temple of God is not about, it's not about a building. It's about our relationship with you. And Father, even as we come to our time of decision this morning, if there's someone that has never given themselves to you, if there's someone that has never committed their life to Christ, Lord, I pray that this would be their day of salvation. That this would be day one of them knowing you and beginning the process of discovering all the things that you have in store for them. Lord, for others that need to become a part of a a church family that's going forward together and discovering all the things that that you would have for us as, as a church family committed to being the presence of Christ in our community. Father, we give this time to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 
more information about First Baptist Church, give us a call or visit us online at firstlubbock.org. Download our mobile app to experience even more from FBC. Check out our other worship times, Sundays at 8.15, 9.30, and 11 a.m. Experience these online or come visit us at Broadway and Avenue V in Lubbock. Thanks for watching, God bless, and have a great week.